Chapter 26 Opening to Abundance Brad picked up and exhausted Ellie and loaded her luggage, which was heavy with scrumptious cookies and stylish ladies' apparel from Japan. He gave her a big hug and inhaled the airplane cabin odors in her hair, an inevitable result of being packed in with 300 people on a 10-hour red-eye flight. I missed you. What is the latest news on Okasan? He asked. I missed you too, she said. Okasan is already home and getting around with the walker, and she said hello to you and to thank you for your concern. Brad opened the passenger door, happy to watch his wife sliding gracefully into the seat, thankful that Ellie Yamashita had picked him out of all of the men on earth. Otasan said the doctor was impressed by her fast recovery, and our prayers must have worked, she continued. Otasan, I wonder if he still thinks I'm a traitor for what I did as a teenager, thought Brad. But there was no pain or self-judgment hook to the thought only a knowing that whatever happened between them would play itself out and harmony would prevail. He got behind the wheel and pulled away from the curb. How were your meditations, hon? Did you have any awakenings? He asked playfully. The temple trip had been her gift, and with Sensi's admission that none of his monks were enlightened, had catalyzed his inner transformation. He felt he owed her the details. I didn't do any, just chanting for Oko-san, she said. There was too much going on with Oka-san, and Ota-san needed help. They're both getting older. Well, I had a breakthrough, he said as he navigated the busy traffic out of the international terminal and onto 101 North. I was down for more than a week, dealing with my dark night of the soul. You remember the teaching to kill your ego in order to spiritually awaken? It's worse than that. I think it explains why so few people achieve enlightenment. Putting the events of the past two weeks into bullet points suddenly seemed futile. He let go of the idea and chuckled merrily. If it was worse than that, then why are you laughing? Did your ego die? She looked at him curiously. The harsh teaching about ego death had never sat well with her. No, it didn't, but it took a very different perspective. What I thought was my ego filling my awareness is now a small fragment of myself that shrunk into the background. Nothing dies. It just shifts. A shift of awareness, just like many describe. Oh, I like that. But what's taking up your awareness now? Ellie's eyes brightened. Nothing. Everything. Just a flow of beingness without thoughts or sensations. I've had it in moments before, especially in meditation. But now it's endless. I am whatever I am aware of in the moment, with no attachment to it. And I'm the beingness with no limits. I love to hear all that, she giggled. I feel something nice from you. Every moment is an inspiration. I can hardly wait to see what will happen next, even if it's the old routine. Brad had been feeling expansive energy in his body. His movements seemed easier and he was lighter on his feet. They arrived at their parking garage. He hoisted her big suitcase out of the car and they trundled toward the elevator. I have no desire to go back to the temple and show Sensi that I beat his monks at anything especially enlightenment. He laughed from the relief he felt being able to say that. Oh, good. We don't need any more mountain walks. Then she said in a worried voice, Are you still going to work? There was no room for poverty in Ili's life. Otasan had taught her that. Of course, I never stopped. I just had some downtime. They're double booking me now to make up for it. Entering the elevator for the ride up to their floor, husband and wife remained quiet until they were in the apartment where Ellie looked around carefully, going from room to room, as was her custom after being away from home for a while. You kept everything clean. Thank you, honey. I didn't want you to have to do any dirty work after two weeks of caring for your family. She turned the shower on and was taking off her clothes. Brad was energized and spoke to her through the glass shower door as she scrubbed herself. I reviewed that book you were reading last year, Opening to Abundance, and I had an inspiration. The Zen Cohen about chopping wood and carrying water makes complete sense now. There's nothing better to do than to keep working. Everything changed, yet nothing changes. That's nice. Let's be mindful of everything, she said, singing the words. Within a minute after toweling off, Ellie was asleep on the bed. He looked at her, loving her more than anything, more than ever. His heart had expanded and filled space as far as he could conceive it.
There was not a single moment of experience for Brad Rosedale that was untouched by this great heart. He pulled a blanket over her and slipped a pillow under her dreamy face. With Ellie home, Okasan recovering and no more inner drive goading Brad to beat the competition. The world invited rediscovery. His old routine became a sparkle of inspiration in each moment. Sitting at his PC as Ellie slept, he reviewed updates in some online medical journals when a psychotherapy conference called Non-Dual Wisdom caught his eye. The practitioners were implementing an approach to help their clients, one that made them feel accepted by creating a safe space and restored them to wholeness or unity, which solves the core problem of feeling isolated. Not only were the practitioners psychotherapists with PhDs, but some were spiritual teachers. At least one of them had been recognized by Adyashanti as enlightened and was giving satsangs, which he described as gatherings for seekers of truth. There was the word truth again. Now he understood how much the capital letter was deserved. Brad was intrigued by the impact the non-dual wisdom approach could have on human suffering and wondered how he could incorporate it into his medical practice. He leaned back in the chair and contemplated what was wrong with the traditional doctor-patient relationship. There are three common complaints that patients have about their doctors. He didn't listen to me. He didn't touch me. And he didn't tell me anything I needed to know. Aha! Two of the three would be covered by making patients feel accepted and restoring them to wholeness. Adding in the element of human touch would complete it for a three-part approach. By the time Ellie awoke hours later, her inspired husband had a full-page outline with references to support this new patient-centered approach to medical office visits. The following day, he tried to discuss it with two of his colleagues. He didn't expect an enthusiastic response, so he wasn't surprised when he didn't get one. He shared with more providers over a couple of weeks. They could understand the importance of listening to the patient to make them feel accepted, and they related to the importance of doing a physical exam and establishing touch. Hell, I at least shake their hand if I'm too busy to examine them, one of his colleagues said proudly. But what probably doomed his protocol to the dustbin of good ideas were the responses of doctors and physician assistants who had no desire to consider something as nebulous as unity or to entertain the idea of restoring a patient to wholeness. They had no time or interest to worry about whether feelings of isolation or separation had anything to do with the healing process. Interesting stuff, one doctor said. You seem to be on to something. Excuse me, I have a real patient to go and see. And yet, when Brad applied the non-dual wisdom approach to his practice, it opened a fire hose of referrals. Patients were coming out of the exam room glowing. Word got around, and within a few months, his staff was double booking him and his colleagues were referring difficult cases like chronic pain patients who needed anger management or injured workers who were non-compliant or anxiety-ridden people with bad backs and lists of questions. He worked hard, long days without complaint, balancing the demands on a new bubble of inspiration that had come from his spiritual awakening. The money was coming in, and it allowed the Rosedales, with Ellie's meager income, to move into a nearby spacious penthouse condo with three balconies and a view of the bay. The downpour of referral started to remind Brad of his time many years ago working with Dr. Black, who had left town and abandoned dozens of injured patients that Brad had inherited, a crushing workload that led to the crash and burn that had nearly killed him. What have I learned from that? I am not going there again, not this time, not ever. So he convinced the staff to limit his schedule to 25 patients a day. He dialed down his efforts to make patients feel accepted and reduced the energy and time spent reassuring them to feel restored to wholeness. In effect, he went back to being the nice, competent professional who did his best to give patients what they needed, but nothing more. What a shame. Medicine in America is not in the business of giving people the warm fuzzies and is certainly not interested in contributing to their spiritual evolution. It's all about chop wood and carry water. And that's exactly what I will do, he thought. He accepted his failure to implement the teachings of non-dual wisdom into the exam room. He would apply them selectively when he could, so a few patients might occasionally benefit. But the flame of inspiration to help people would have to find another place to bring light.